Welcome to City Church of Dallas. It is so powerful what God is doing here. So just tune in, open up your heart, let the music open up your heart, worship right where you are with us in your hotel room or in your office or in your home and let God touch your life. Let the word go deep inside of your heart. Words are seeds. Let them produce a harvest. Let them be planted in the soil of your heart and let God do a great work in you. I'm so excited that you are here with us for this broadcast. I believe God will change your life.
ever been in that place, and maybe you're in that place right now, where God is saying it's time to step in.
you have us called to do, and that is to step into the water, God, because we know we want to go wherever you would lead us. We want to offer the life-changing love of Christ to a world in need, and we know this church, God, we believe the doors will open. We believe, God, the things that you will do. church in 2016. I believe it's going to be a year of new beginnings for us as a church, and I believe it's going to be a year of new beginnings for your life individually. And so get excited about what God has in store for you. And so I believe, I'm excited about what God has in store for my life, for the worship team, for your life individually. So stir up your faith and believe that this is going to be a year of great new beginnings in 2016. Do you believe that for your life? I do. I'm excited. I'm leaving this year thankful that I'm alive. I'm healed and restored. God kept me in 2015, but our greatest days are ahead of us in 2016. Do you believe that? Amen. City Church of Dallas, we're in for a treat. On the front row right here in front of me, it's this wonderful man named Pastor Barnett. I've been with Pastor Jeff for 18 years this year, me and Peaches. And for probably about as long as that, I guess, isn't it, Peaches? Um, you know, Pastor Jeff travels and ministers as well, too. And he's been a ministry friend of ours. Jeff, Pastor Jeff has ministered at his church for as long as I can remember, probably that many years. And he pastors a phenomenal church in Corpus Christi, has for many, many years, and Pastor Jeff has ministered to his church. And so for when we started City Church, we would tell him, Pastor Burnett, you're going to have to come minister at City Church. And he just never showed up. <laughs> Pastor Burnett, you're going to come to City Church. And he just never came to City Church. And we just knew he was going to come to City Church. We just kept going to his church and kept going to his church. And his church 
over all these years, 18 years, has been the biggest blessing to Jeff Ferguson Ministries and to our ministries. And you are such a wonderful man, such a great, great man, such a great friend of our ministry. To Pastor Jeff, a phenomenal man, so anointed, so powerful. It is our honor today when Pastor Jeff is not here to have this phenomenal man, Pastor Barnett, in the pulpit ministering us today. City Church of Dallas, put your hands together and please welcome Pastor Barnett to the pulpit. God bless you. Open your heart to receive this phenomenal word. It's a wonderful opportunity to have him here today. I love you. Thank you. You're so gracious. Amen. Thank y'all. Praise and worship was great. Amen. Well, y'all don't know me, and I don't know y'all, uh, but it's good to be here, and uh, God's good. How many believe God's good? Uh, Pastor Jeff called me yesterday and uh, asked me if I would come up and preach today because it was going to be hard for him to make it back. So I said, sure, I'm already halfway up here. As long as I can preach in jeans and tennis shoes. So, so I left home without my Bible, without my notes, without anything. And uh, uh, so I thought, I'm, I'm scheduled to preach here, I think, January the 17th. And uh, God's given me a message for y'all on January the 17th. And uh, I uh, thought, well, maybe I should share it today, but the Lord told me just wait till the 17th. And I tell you what, God has great things for this church. I think you, it hasn't entered into your heart what God has for you in store. Amen. But tonight, I'm going to do what I call in South Texas, fool around. It's just fool around. I have been preaching 50 years. And uh, I pastored for 29 years. I pastored for 29 years. I retired two years ago. And uh, since then, I've been traveling and preaching here and there and kind of doing what I want to do. Uh, actually, the last uh, seven or eight years, I do what I want to do. <laughs> Even when I was pastor. Uh, if I wanted to get out of bed, I got out of bed. If I didn't, I didn't. If I wanted to preach, I preached. If I didn't, I didn't. But I usually always wanted to. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I don't usually do this, but, you know, there's not too much I haven't been through. I've been through hell in life. I told my church, I haven't, I've had marriage failures. I've had baby, my baby died in my arms. I've lost twins. There's not too much that you, I don't imagine you've probably been to, through. I know some of y'all have been through a lot of things, but I have probably been through just about everything. And I will tell you this, it's still worth serving God. I have no complaints with God at all. But what's happened to me in the midst of all of my problems, all of my trials and failures, I asked the Lord, teach me why. And God has taught me why. And so I don't know tonight what I'll teach. I don't even know what I'll say. I just ask the Holy Spirit to lead me. But I'm going to tell you what. God's doing the best for you that he can right now. He cannot do anything else more for you than what he's doing in the condition you're in. That's good. You're asking God to do something and God is more willing to do it for you than you want it. God is not the hang up. He's not the problem. But most people don't understand that. And I want you to understand that God loves you with an everlasting love and his love is not like the world's love. They'll tell you they love you. <laughs> you get married to somebody, I'm with you to the end of this world. And then they become your worst enemy. How many ever had that happen to you? 
They stab you in the back. They love you till they get to know you. <laughs> I preached the message one time. Everybody's normal till you get to know them. <laughs> and then after you get to know me, will you still like me? Well, God already knows how I am. And he loves me, but not only does he love me, God likes me. Me and God is good friends, and I happen to be one of his favorites. I don't know why. It's not because I'm good, because I'm not good. I just happen to be one of his favorites. And I'm glad that I'm one of his favorites. And I always told my church this, if you don't know anything about God, just watch this one thing. Watch what God does in my life, and that's what he does with failures. So I'm going to tell you, there's probably none of you here that has been able to be much more of a failure than I have, but God has proved himself to me over and over and over again. And so I uh, want to read a scripture to you. It's found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. In the Amplified Bible, it's, uh, an Amplified Bible, in the Message Bible, it says this, and God blessed them. He prospered them. He said to prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, and be responsible. God, in the very beginning of time, took man and he blessed him. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, and God blessed him. The message puts it this way, I'll say again. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible. And God blessed them. Then I want to go over to the, that's what God did in the very beginning and God has not changed his mind. He's not changed his mind. Over in the New Testament, God starts, Jesus starts off the New Testament, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are destitute, bankrupt, and has no hope. Blessed are you because you have not missed out on my plan, you're still blessed and you still have everything I promised you in the beginning. So, so many of us feel like, well, I have messed up. It's too late now. No, you've never messed up. It is never too late. Amen. God bless you. So, God bless me. How many of you are blessed? All right, I may talk a little bit about the blessing tonight, but let me tell you something about me. I was, I was never going to be a preacher. We were, uh, uh, I was raised in ultra Pentecost. And uh, that's good, but that's dangerous. It's a miracle that I'm here in more ways than one. But I was raised that way. Uh, matter of fact, I, read, I thought I always told everybody I was going to be a preaching deacon. I went to Bible school telling everybody I was going to be a preaching deacon. The reason I was going to be a preaching deacon because when I was Oh, about 12, 13 years old, God spoke to me and told me, I'm going to make you rich. And I didn't think you could be a rich and be a preacher too. Because in the church that I come from, they'd pay you tithes to the preacher. And the preacher had drove too nice to the car. They decided they was paying him too much tithes, so they cut his tithes back, so he had to get a cheaper car. <laughs> so I thought there ain't no way to be rich and be a preacher, so I can't be a preacher. I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> so... so well, I tell you, I come out from, you know, that's just what I was, was. I, you know, so, you know, but I tell you what, I was at a meeting one time when I was five years old, and I was in, down in Corpus Christi, a Bayfoot, at Bayfront Auditorium, and I always tell, this is how I got called in the ministry, and there was a woman that walked up there, and A.A. A. Allen, have you ever heard of A.A. A. Allen? A.A. A. Allen was there. He, has, he used to pit, pastor in Ingleside right there by Corpus Christi. A. A. Allen was there, and this woman walked up, and she looked like I was sitting on about the fifth row, just a little ways back. Looked like she was about seven months pregnant. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And he asked that woman, he says, Ma'am, what do you want me to do? She says, I want God to heal me. He says, What's wrong? He says, She said, Well, she looked like she was pregnant. 
And that's what I thought. And that's what evidently he thought. He, she says, I have a tumor and I want God to heal my tumor. So after that, he says, just she puts her, you believe God's going to do it? Yes, ma'am, I believe God's going to do it. So she puts her hands in the air and starts praising God. He says, ma'am, I believe if God's going to heal your tumor, I believe I'd hold on to my skirt. Uh -oh. <laughs> so she reaches down and grabs her skirt, and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who I serve and whose I am, I curse this tumor, and I command it to go in Jesus' name. And right before her eyes, just like that, it was gone. God spoke to me and told me I've called you and you will see things like that before the end. Church, we're in the days now that God wants to do miracles. And the hang up is really not God. It's us. You see, there's the law of miracles. There's all kinds of law. And what we, you know, we, we, we think, well, God may just do something. I'm going to tell you what, God does everything exact by law. There's the law of miracles. Once you understand the law, you can work miracles all the time. I think I'm starting to understand it. When you understand the law, for, for instance, let me give you an example. I'm a pilot and I have an airplane. There's a law of thrust and the law of lift. I can give that the full throttle, start off down the runway, and as I start off down the runway, the law of thrust will make me go forward, then the law of lift lifts the plane up, and I'll begin to fly. I supersede the law of gravity, because it's a law. It works all the time. That law was in existence 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, that law is just as real as it is today. But no one understood it. They would say, if you flew, it was a miracle. And they would say it was a miracle because they did not understand it. But it was law. There's the law of the blessing. There's the law of sowing and reaping. You reap with exact mathematical precision that which you have sown. <coughs> Today, you have reaped, or you are today what you thought you were two days ago and said to yourself yesterday, and now you are what you are because you have made yourself that way. It is nobody's fault but yours. So many people have a victim mentality. You can never be a victim and a victor at the same time. We have been made in the image and the likeness of God. God never worries about the devil. He never worries what the devil is going to do. He don't fret over the devil's power. He has no worry about him at all. And we have been made in his image and his likeness and we have his DNA in us and we also have his mind in us. So therefore the devil has no power over us. And we have nothing at all to fear. Amen? Say nothing to fear. Y'all got that. So I'm going to just, be, is this meddling too much? All right. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about blessing, prosper. God wants to prosper you. God wants you blessed. I always say this way, prospering is this, having more money at the end of your month than month. <laughs> That's prosperity. When the month's here, when the month's gone, you still got money. Yeah. A lot of times it's five days, five days, oh God, what am I going to do? Yeah. God wants you prosperous. He wants you to have more money than month. So to everybody it's a little bit different, but prosperity is something I'm going to tell you something about prosperity. God wants you prosperous, and I'm going to tell you what, God's not the problem why you're not prosperous, because God wants you that way. God put it to me this way, I don't care what you have as long as what you have don't have you. And there's a lot of people working for money because they love money. You don't have to work for money, let money work for you. 
Amen. If you if you see you see, I was taught different. And I'm glad I was taught different. The Bible says six days you shall labor, on the seventh day you shall rest. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. My dad told me whether I got paid or not, I was supposed to work. I heard my dad tell somebody one time, whether if he's not doing anything but digging a ditch and covering it up again, I'm going to have him doing it because the Bible says he's supposed to work. <laughs> so I, it was put in me, you're supposed to work. Well, that's what the Bible says, I'm supposed to work. And, 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 and it didn't say whether or not I got paid or not. So I just started working. And I'm going to tell you what, when you work, when you work for God, God will pay you. See, so many people are working for people. If you work for people, you're trusting them. If you work for God, then you trust God. Now, let me tell you this. When, uh, you know, when I was young, so I learned a lot. By the time I was 12 years older, I got a wire house totally by myself. And so when I, grew, when I graduated from high school, I went to college, and I come home from college, and I decided I was going to help some churches. So I put the wiring and air conditioning in six or seven churches free. And on my way to my first church to do it, God spoke to me. He says, you gonna let them pay, are, are you going to let them pay you, or are you going to let me pay you? I says, uh, I'll let them pay me. No, I'll tell you. Then, it, then I said, no, I'll let you pay me. So he said, I said, okay. So I went. It took me about four years to do seven churches, wiring and air conditioning. I did it free. I didn't get paid for it. That was when I was about 20 years old. When I was about 40 years old, God blessed me with a supernatural blessing, big blessing. And he said, I paid you back. 20 years in coming. But what I'm telling you is this. If I had worked to get something from God, I'd have gave up before I ever got it. But see, it's not worked that way. I love God. I worked for God, and people paid me. There's a difference because a lot of people love money so much you can't serve God and money both. So you have to work for God. Let me give you an example. I'm going to talk about prosperity because God wants you prosperous, but you got to have right thinking about money. All right. Uh, we take pay tithes and offerings and everything. People say that you know they can't afford it, or really you can't afford not to because you know it's a, it's a sign to God that He is your God, not money. And I'm not I'm not here to preach about money because I don't. We're not going to take an offering for me, so that I'm not doing this to get anything out of you. I don't believe in preachers send me your offerings and I will bless you. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, God's going to bless you. You don't have to worry about that. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so I'm not one of those type of guys. But let me tell you this. There was a, there was a steward in the Bible, and he was crooked. He wasn't doing right. So his boss was going to fire him. Y'all remember this story of the unfaithful steward? So the boss is going to fire him. So he found out he was about to get fired, so he went to all his bosses, uh, creditors, and said, how much do you owe my boss? Oh, you owe him 100? We'll change it to 80. You owe him 100? We'll change it to 50. You owe him 40? All right, we'll change it to 20. I mean, he changed everybody's bill. And when the boss come, found out about it, the boss didn't fire him. The boss did not fire him. Now, most people... We got really mad and fired the guy and had him arrested. And Jesus said something. He says, people in this world are smarter than godly people. Why did he not fire him? Well, first of all, first of all, the man wasn't upset because he lost it. Because it wasn't his. He was a steward for God. I can have a thousand dollars and lose it. You're not going to get upset because it's not yours. First, next of all, here's the most important thing: was if the boss fired the man, then the man would take all the man, all the boss's business, start his own business, and the boss would go bankrupt. But if the boss kept the man on, now the boss is the one that looks good. Because the man still works for the boss. And now everybody's faithful to the boss because he cut everybody's bill in half. And now he has customers for life. Yep. Y'all see the difference? Most people are so in love with money they can't see the principle 
that's involved in it. That's good. Real simple. Matter of fact, there was one Jesus gave one talent to, another one he gave two talents, and then he gave five. And he come back, and the one that had two went, had gained two more. The one that had five had gained five more. The one that had one went and hit it. And God took the one from one and didn't give it to the one that had two, but he gave it to the richest one. They had ten. Why? Because he was smarter. You know why? Because he was able to trust the what he could do. And what we need to do, well, I'm telling you about prosperity. Prosperity, you cannot be prosperous and love money. <coughs> because then money will have you. And sometimes God don't let money come to you because then it will have you. That's good. If God, if you was broke and you won the lottery of a million dollars, would God gain a million dollars or lose a man? If you'd lose a man, then you can't handle prosperity. And we all want to be prosperous, but the thing about it is, see what we don't realize with everything, I want to tell you this one thing else. How many wants to be blessed? You cannot be blessed without, a, first of all, an act of obedience. That's good. See, God has blessed you. I said this statement. God has blessed you to the maximum amount that he can bless you now. God cannot do anything more for you than what he's already done until, first of all, there's a greater act of obedience. When you act in obedience, now you unlock the power for God to bless. So now what's happened to you, every one of you in this building, I don't care who you are, you go through tests every day of your life. Amen. Life is a test. What you do with it, your attitude toward it, and how you respond to it. It's not so much where we're headed, but it's what happens to us, what happens to us on, on the way and how we perceive it and how it changes us. It either makes us bitter or it makes us better. It does something to you. Life will do something to you. And that is a test. You decide what it will do. So therefore that test will determine where you are. It's real simple. When I was a kid growing up, we were so poor that my dad would go to town, buy feed for the hogs, bring it home, and we'd dip our sack, we'd dip our, uh, take it in the house, we eat the same thing the hogs ate. It was called shorts. And was there eight shorts? Shorts was ground up wheat that you fed the hogs and you mix it with, with, with milk and you make you feel full. Might not have much, but it'd make you feel full, would it? Yeah. I mean, you'd be hungry, but you eat those shorts, honey, you feel full. And you wouldn't get much weight gain either. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what it is to be without, but I know what it is to be with. And I'm just telling you some of the things that God taught me to help me be able to pass the test to be blessed with prosperity. You got to look at it totally different. You got to realize everything that comes to you is not yours, it's his. So when he tells you to give it, it's not so hard to give it. If you lose it, you don't cry. The Bible says that. God makes a man rich and he adds no sorrow. So that means if you have it, if you don't have it, it'll make you a difference. You're still happy. Because there's only one thing that's going to make you happy, and that's the Lord. Psalm chapter 144 says, Happy is he whose God is the Lord. Let's say this God is my Lord, so I'm happy. So I'll let you know something. If you're happy, he's your Lord. If you're not happy, he's not your Lord. If, he's not, if you're not happy, something else got control of you. And it's something that he don't want to have control of you. See, he wants to control of you because if he has control of you, you're going to be happy. Uh, oh, yeah, it's going to be all right. <laughs> I don't understand, but it's going to be all right. Y'all understand? So God wants to prosper you. 
He wants to prosper you. But some of you need to change your attitude about money. And you, re, you, you need to realize that what happens, you know, the Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All of these things will be added unto you. So you don't, so many people are seeking houses and homes and cars and, and clothes and food and everything. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Those three things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You seek those three things and all these things are going to be added unto you. You don't have to worry about seeking money. You don't have to worry about seeking jobs. You don't have to worry about, if you seek those three things, God will see to it that it comes to you. Matter of fact, it will come over you and chase you down. I, used to, I like to put it this way. How many of you, when you went and turned your electricity on, you called the power company and say, where's my bill? <laughs> I hadn't got my bill yet. Where's my bill? Send me my bill. No, y'all never do that. Why? Because you know it's going to show up. <laughs> That's like it is with God. When you start serving God, you don't have to ask him, where's my blessing? Honey, it's going to show up. It's just going to come. You can't stop it. Just like you can't stop that bill, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that blessing is going to come and it cannot be stopped. I don't care who's against you. That's the law. The law of gravity is always there, but the law of Thrust and the law of lift is there too. So there is a law, the law of blessing. When you're blessed, you're blessed, and it don't make any difference who tries to curse you. You're already blessed. You are what the God Bible says you are. And people say, well, I'm trying. Well, if you're trying, that means you're never going to make it. You just got to be what you are. Say, I am. So say, I am blessed. Every one of you has been blessed. God bless you from the very, very beginning of time. So when we start getting ourselves in the position to think right about these things, God will see to it that you're prosperous. The next thing here, this is, uh, that's the most I've ever preached on prosperity on this at one time. But the next one is, he says, reproduce. And I want to tell you what, this right here is a very good one. Reproduce. Say reproduce. reproduce. God wants us to pack out this church. He wants it packed out. So that means he wants you to reproduce believers. Now he told Adam and Eve to reproduce. Now let me tell you something about reproduce, reproduction. For a man and wife to reproduce, the man has to get the woman to fall in love with the man. And when the woman falls in love with the man, now she has persuasive, he, he has persuasive ability to say, let's make some babies. Oh, yeah. All right. Persuasive ability. So he says, fill the earth. So then when he told you to fill the earth, he gave within you the power to be persuasive. All right. You have the power to persuade. You can persuade anybody you want to persuade because God has given you that ability. I have tried it. I have tried it in every area. I got on the phone one time, called somebody, they said, Mr. Barnett, you don't understand. That's our policy. I said, so I said, to me, I said, all right, God, you gave me the power to persuade. I'm going to persuade them. I said, yes, that's your policy. And policies are made for crooks. And I'm not a crook. <laughs> so you're going to listen to me. And here's what we're going to do. And I persuaded them to do what I wanted them to do because that's what was just and right. The power to reproduce. The power of persuasion. As a matter of fact, I, live in, uh, I was in the town in which I was living in and there was a man. He was wealthy, had everything going for him. He didn't need God, he didn't want God. So I thought, well, God, I'm going to persuade him to turn to Jesus. It took me three years and $13,000, but I persuaded him to turn to the Lord. Persuasive ability. It's not my money anyway. It's God's money. So I, ha I have realized if I want it, I can persuade you to do it. I want to tell you something right now. There is nothing better in the world than serving God. Nothing better. Yes, God. 
I mean, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be, oh, look so, you don't have to look so, so, all you have to do is be honest. I told this one time to God, God, I know what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it right now. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you make me willing and I'll do it. Man, they tell you what, he made me willing real fast. <laughs> okay, God, I want to do it now. And I realized God put the desire inside of me he wanted me to have. So you just talk to him. You know, I tell him, man, God, here's what you want me to do. I don't want to do it. So God, you put the want to inside of me. And he will do it, but he won't do it unless you ask him. Now he don't like hypocrites. He loves them, but he don't like them. Are y'all here? Say, I have been blessed. I have the power to persuade. Some of you think you have no power at all. Somebody, some of you, I mean, if you need a job, you can persuade. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact, my dad told this guy one time, he says, I need a job. My dad says, where do you want to work? He said, I want to work down here at this gas station. My dad said, we'll go down there and go to work. He said, I went down there. The guy said, you don't need any help. I said, well, he said, my dad didn't say, he didn't, didn't ask if the guy needs the help. Go down there and go to work. To work. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm down here to work. He said, I'm not, I didn't hire you. He said, I know, but I'm going to work. <laughs> so he works for three months. And then he says, because he comes back to my dad and says, I'm working for three months, but I got to get paid. So my dad told him, go tell him you quit. <laughs> I'm talking persuasive ability. God will give you the ability to persuade. So he goes down and tells the man, I quit. The guy says, you can't quit. He says, yes, you can. You're not paying me. So the guy hired him. <laughs> In 10 years, the guy owned the station. I will tell you, God wants you to reproduce. You have it in you. From the very beginning of time, God says, I'm going to bless them. And I don't care if you're poor and destitute in spirit. God has given you the power to reproduce. Y'all hear me? I'm going to tell you what. I didn't get my wife to fall in love with me by being angry and mean. And some of you are angry and mean because you hadn't forgiven somebody. And you go home and you're always home. You're always. I'm meddling now. And you're wondering what in the world's going to happen to this woman. You know, I'll tell you what. I, I had a man who won't come to my office counseling. And this man says, man, I, this is just not the same woman I married. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've been married 13 years, and when I got married, man, she used to rub my feet. She cooked, the, she cooked food. Everything was great all the time. Now she comes in. She won't do anything but grab at me. I said, well, it is strange how, how she turned out when she was under your leadership. You got a problem with your wife? You cause it. You got a problem with your husband? You probably call. I had this one woman pray me. Pray my husband. Well, you know, you, you, he's out running around. Uh, you know, I don't want him running around. So I said, all right, we'll pray. So he come home. He started coming home all the time. He was grumpy when he come home. She says, my husband. I said, well, at least he's coming home now. You know, just like he came home, God can change his heart. The Bible says a woman can change her husband by her chaste conversation or her manner of life. You have the power, women, to change your husband. My wife can get anything out of me she wants to. I can get anything out of her I want to. I know how. You know what? God told me to reproduce, and with that reproduction came persuasion. Hey, baby. And I don't persuade her by putting her down. I tell her, man, you look good tonight, man. <laughs> you know, everybody gets put down all the time. But God gives you the ability to persuade. 
You're going to have to listen to the Holy Spirit and he will give you the wisdom. The Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. So God will give you the wisdom to win a soul or gain control of their mind so they'll do what you want. Now you've got to be with this one thing. I want them to know Jesus the way I know Jesus because if they know Jesus the way I know Jesus, they're going to be happy. Are y'all getting it? Yes, yes, so now, if you're not happy and you're grippy, you go get on that phone. Policy, you got to tell you where you put that policy. <laughs> <laughs> See, you got to get saved <laughs> and you got to forgive before you're ever even able to be prosperous or to persuade. See, you can't do this if you ain't got it inside. If you don't have it inside, you can't persuade. Because most women know when a man's trying to seduce her or when he loves her. And most people can pick up a seduction versus a genuine care and the truth. You know the truth. And the truth will make you free, but it has to be the truth. So you can fake it, but you won't make it. <laughs> Y'all hear me? You got to get Jesus in your heart so he'll give you the wisdom. And he'll give you the wisdom too. Next thing he says, prosper. He says, reproduce. The next thing he says, fill the earth. And I'm going to tell you what, this works too. Fill the earth. The Bible says in the last days, the glory of the knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth. So that means that God wants you to let everybody know all the good things he's done for you. So he wants you to fill the earth with the knowledge of God's goodness in your life. So that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about God does to me. God Bless me abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. He has blessed me more. As a matter of fact, I have not ever even asked to be blessed. I have never asked God, you bless me. I have never asked God, do this. And God has blessed me over and over and more abundantly than I could ever ask. And I'm going to tell you what. That comes... Fill the knowledge. One thing you got to do is be, when you want the glory of God, let me tell you about the glory of God. The glory of God comes about in your heart because of the Holy Ghost. Now, how many has been filled with the Holy Ghost? I'm going to tell you what, this is a precious thing. A lot of times people look at the, I want to meddle a little bit. People look at the Holy Ghost. I know I was brought up in church and you got, got to pray in tongues. And that's what, the Holy Ghost is praying in tongues. But you know what the first person did in the Old Testament that was filled with the Holy Ghost? The first person that was filled with the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, they were given the power to be expert craftsmen in gold and brass and iron. They became expert in their field. Expert in their field. The Holy Ghost taught them. I got out of high school. I was a licensed electrician. I came home from Bible college. My dad sent me to work on an appliance. I got ready to work on this plant, and it was so full of grease, and it was under warranty. And that thing was nasty, man. There was grease that thick on that thing. It was only about three months old, and it was broken. They just wanted me to fix it under warranty. So I started trying to fix this thing, and it was nasty. And I told her, man, lady, if you clean this up, I'll fix it. So she cleans it up, and I fix it, and I go back to tell my dad, I'm not going to work on appliances anymore. That's it. He said, well, what are you going to do besides electrical? I'm going to do air conditioning. He said, you don't know anything about air conditioning. No, nope, I don't, but I'm going to learn. So I went to class, learned the basics. The compressor compresses, it goes here, da 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 da. Three days, took me the basics. All right, I'm ready. So I went in business for myself. And air conditioning. Don't know anything, do I? Yeah, I do. I know God. I'm going to tell you what people would call. They'd tell me what the problem was. I'd go back to my office. I'd pick the part up, put it in my pocket, go out and get my truck and go out there. And go out there, open the air conditioner up, put that part in there, and then run. God taught me air conditioning. I did not know it, but God taught it to me. He taught it to me. Now, if I got frustrated, I couldn't hear from God, I'd go back to the office, tell my dad, you're going to have to help me. He says, no, you're going to go back over there and do it yourself. So I'd have to get calm, hear from God, and go fix it. 
God taught it. I'm very smart on air conditioning. I was real good. I was in business for years. As a matter of fact, I still do some on the side, but not much. So God taught me air conditioning. I preached this in the church. I preached this in the church here about a, month, about a year, no, three months ago, four months ago. There was a guy sitting out there, and the job, he, hadn't, he didn't have a job. He was, man, he was in bad shape. He was about to lose his house, about to lose everything. He heard me preach. So he started out going out looking for jobs. He went up to this guy and they asked him, hey, what kind of jobs? He said, we only got one job. That's for a bulldozer op operator. He never even been on, seen a bulldozer hardly. The bulldozer operator. He said, I can do it. His wife told him, remember, you can do anything. God can teach you. He said, I can do it. So he goes out there and gets on that bulldozer and God teaches him. And in three days' time, he says, I'm doing as good as that other guy is over there. He says, now I'm getting paid. The bulldozer help. He says, I've never made but minimum wage before in my entire life. And now I'm getting paid that of a bulldozer operator. And that's happening right now in Beeville, Texas. Because God taught him what he didn't know. See, the Holy Spirit will cause you to be able to tell everybody about God's goodness. And every, the whole earth will be filled about how God has blessed you. And I'm going to tell you what, God has blessed me abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. I, I want to, I'm supposed to. Oh, Lord. I'll talk one more minute about that one. With, <laughs> Jesus, I'm too long-winded. Uh, so God wants you to fill the knowledge there. Next one says, take charge. Say, take charge. Take charge. You need to take charge. Now, I'm going to tell you what. You don't have to fight the devil. You know why? People say, I've been fighting the devil. Well, quit fighting him. Amen. Don't mess with him. <laughs> Jesus fought the devil 2,000 years ago, defeated him. It's over. It's done with. As a matter of fact, even Michael the archangel was coming to get down to Moses' body, body. And when he did, the devil says, you can't have it. And Jesus says one thing. I mean, uh, uh, Gabriel said one thing. April, uh, Michael said one thing, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't even fight him. So don't mess with the devil. He's already defeated. He has no power over you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus whipped him. People come to me. Well, the devil keeps telling me. All right, it's over now. If the devil, if it's the devil keep telling you, don't worry about it. He ain't going to come to pass. He's just a liar. So you don't have to worry about it. So take charge. I'll tell you what I was doing on a ranch. I was carrying my groceries in. The front door was open. We carried the groceries in, we walked back, and there was about a six foot, seven foot snake coming in the front door. It starts off down the hall, everybody yells and screams and jumps up on the couch. And I says, turn around, and that snake turns around, goes right back past the door. It's supposed to go out the door, so it goes past the door. I says, turn around, so that snake turns back around, and when he gets to the door, this time it says, go out, and the snake turns and goes out. I was shocked. <laughs> It just come out of me. It happened. I did it before I knew it. And it worked. <laughs> I didn't think. I, I wasn't planning some spiritual thing. I just was yelling. And it did what I said. So I got to thinking, yeah, if a little pig comes to my house, I'm not going to say, please, little piggy, get out. I'm going to say, get out. Take charge. There are some things you need to take charge of in your life. You can ask my wife. You know, you get ready to pray for somebody, out! And then they'll jump. <laughs> and I tell you what, it goes out, don't it? How many times have you seen that? Too many times to count. <laughs> out! <laughs> you bad thinking, out! <laughs> Take charge. That's good. Last one, and I'll close with this. I won't, I won't tell you too many examples. Be responsible. Be responsible. You only have power over what you're responsible for. If you got a problem with your children, oh, I didn't do it. They did it. You cannot change your children until you're responsible for their actions. You cannot change a nation until you repent for their sins. The only thing you have power over are the things you're responsible for. Daniel sought the Lord because he knew the sins of the nation. He accepted the responsibility of the nation, so he became an intercessor. So when I accept your wrong and I become responsible for your wrong, then I have power over you. 
So when you accept the wrongs of the people in the world, you have now power over them to change them. If you're responsible, you can change it. If you're not responsible, you can't change it. Not only that, whatever you're responsible for, you'll keep. Some people get a car, trash it out, not responsible. They lose it. First thing you know, they're drive, not, driving nothing but junkers. You get a new car, you're responsible for it, you take care of it, you'll drive a new car. God will give you, he will give you whatever you're responsible for. If you're not responsible, you won't get it. Not responsible for the house you live in, not responsible for your space, you don't take care of it, you'll never get anything better. See, life is a test. You determine your obedience to pass the test brings you a blessing. Your disobedience keeps you where you are. Remember, God cannot change where you are until you change your actions and your thoughts. God wants you blessed more than you want to be blessed. But it has to come with some change. This lady tonight was saying that God wants some of you to step in all the way. This some of you, God's calling for a greater step simply so he can do more in your life. He wants to bless you coming in, bless you going out. He wants to do abundantly above what you could ever ask or think, but you have limited the Holy One of Israel. And God is wanting to bring change to your heart and your life. He's wanting you to operate in a law that cannot be stopped, that you may receive the blessing he has for you. Let's all stand. If I preach to you tonight, raise, put your hand on top of your head and say, Father, I receive the words I heard tonight. I ask you, Father, to give me the grace to obey and receive all that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was preaching to you about committing, I'm not going to ask you forward, but if I preach to you and you want to you commit further, would you raise your hand? You want to commit further to the Lord tonight? i just going to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come up or anything. Yes, see those hands. Yes, yes. Yes, Father, I pray, God, you help them to be able to commit. Let them see your goodness. You said it's the goodness of God that brings men change. Let them see your goodness, Lord, so they may be able to receive all the goodness you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. enjoyed that word by Pastor Barnett. Praise the Lord. What a good word. A timely word and a great season that we need here at City Church. So I always believe those words are so timely. So we take those words and we run with it and we obey. So now it's time to sow and time to give here at City Church of Dallas. So if you can get your tithes ready, the tithe, the tenth is the Lord's. We need you to hear from God today here at City Church. So please be obedient. Please have your offering ready. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure of pressed down, shaken together and running over. This is the last Sunday of 2015. So if you can, be obedient and so a gift into the City Church of Dallas. If you're watching online, I encourage you today to go to citychurchofdallas.com. We need your help today here at City Church. This is an opportunity to sow in what God has called us to do here at City Church of Dallas. You can go online and PayPal and sow today on the City Church of Dallas. I know many of you do that today. We need you to help us today. Please exit 2015, give it into the Lord. This is a great ministry. We're doing great things at City Church of Dallas. So please pay your tithe. Please sow into what God has called us to do. I encourage you to give today. Um, if you need an envelope, please raise your hand. The ushers are going about now. So raise your hand. Let's give unto the Lord. The Lord loves what? A cheerful giver. So if we can shout at the football games, we can shout when we give unto the Lord. So let's take this opportunity to give unto God. God bless you. Your seat. It's your seat. It's your seat.
reason to be blessed. God made you a promise. Oh, yeah. You stood the test. The windows of heaven will pour you out a blessing. It's your season. in the field I'm blessed going out and I'm blessed coming in he's gonna open the windows yeah to pour you out a blessing it's your season it's your season to be blessed it's your season to be blessed this web broadcast of City Church of Dallas. God is doing so many things. It's blowing my mind. I thought we would be a local church, but we'd become an international church through the internet. So what I want you to do, we have people in Iowa, people in Michigan, people all over this country that are sending in support. And because our church is bigger than this room that we're in, and you can feel the actual presence of God, and you are ministered to right over the internet. So if God should lay it on your heart, I want to encourage you to tie. If you don't have a home church, if you have a home church, tie there. If you don't, send your tithe in here to City Church of Dallas. Go to City Church of Dallas. This is how you spell it. 
www.thepeopleshow.com. You can pay on PayPal there, a secure website, or you can send into the address or call in your gift. I promise you, lives are being changed through our prison ministry, nursing home ministry, our AIDS ministry. We feed the hungry, and God is really doing something special. But we're only a little bit more than a year old, so we need people to give. God bless you. I appreciate it with all of my heart.